started the recording. Uh, we're at the magical moment. So let me introduce myself. My name is Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I work at Cornell University through the Cooperative Extension System, and I coordinate the Forest Connect program. Uh, one of the activities of that uh, Forest Connect program is a monthly webinar series. And I'm pleased today to be able to uh, introduce and host Dr. Renee Germain, who's a professor of forestry at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, Renee gave this presentation I saw in the spring at a New York Forest Owners Association meeting. I thought that was a really good presentation and it would be a, a fabulous addition to the webinar series. And I asked Renee if he would present. He said, sure. So that's the, the short history. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn the microphone airwaves over to Renee. And I'm going to turn my microphone. Well, I'm going to make Renee the presenter. So I almost forgot, didn't I? Okay, so now Renee is the presenter, so he can move the screen around. And I'm going to mute my microphone and turn it over to Renee. So, Renee, welcome. And Thank uh, you, Peter. the floor is yours. All right. Uh, well, welcome, everyone, to my, my first uh, webinar. Uh, this is a very interesting experience. Uh, sitting here at my desk, uh, talking to all you folks uh, from around the country. Uh, before I get started, I just will give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I, I have a bachelor's in forestry from the University of Vermont, 1983, and my master's is in business administration from Boston University, uh, 1988. And, uh, and then I worked uh, in Heidelberg, Germany for a year uh, with the Forest Service there, the Heidelberg Forest Service, so that was a great experience. Um, and then when I get, got back from Germany, you know, we um, we lived in the Adirondacks, and I was the uh, resource uh, manager, procurement forester, uh, slash vice president for a uh, sawmill uh, home center, Ward Lumber Company. And so I had a lot of industry background. I was there for uh, over eight years. And at that point, I, I went and... Um, Jumped over a cliff and got my PhD, and uh, and then I stayed here at SUNY ESF. I've been here since 1998, and uh, I do a lot of research on family forests, uh, issues of parcelization. Uh, I do a lot of work with the loggers um, and the industry because of my background, and so that sort of is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, family forests are they productive, sustainable, resilient? Um, this is pretty much a compilation of many of the research projects that uh, me and my graduate students have been doing uh, over the last uh, decade or so. And so the, the outline of the presentation uh, will be, uh, I'll give some context, uh, some background, some of those forces uh, that are acting on family forests, uh, specifically demographics and, and parcelization. And then uh, I'll get into some of the results from our research on family forests, looking at stocking, uh, silviculture, and BNP implementation. And then we'll conclude with, uh, you know, trying to answer these questions of whether they are productive, uh, sustainable, and resilient. And in terms of uh, questions, I'll be looking here at the, at the screen. Uh, I probably would prefer to um, answer questions at the end. But if I see something uh, on the screen that, you know, that is really uh, telling that people just don't understand the, the figure or something, then I can certainly respond to that question. So if I see something there that might benefit the entire audience, I, I can certainly take questions uh, midstream if, if, you, if you don't understand something. Okay, so just a little bit of background. Uh, and this is just for New York. Um, but... Uh, we have 687,000 uh, family forest owners here in New York State. And uh, the slide shows you how the, the breakdown is in terms of the ownership. And, and you can see that you know the bulk of them own less than 10 acres. Uh, I highlighted the red because uh, you know, we're, we think that in terms of uh, sustained yield management and the ability and the economies of scale to do silviculture, uh, you you really do need uh, 25 to 30 acres, and uh, so 105,000 of uh, New York's forest owners um, make up about 8 million of those acres that are above 30 acres. Um, 
Only 4% of the landowners in, the, in New York have management plans, and they represent 11% of the area. This is a fairly, uh, the national average is actually 3%, so we're, we're right there in terms of, uh, and it's, it's a struggle that we've been having uh, for the last 50 years is getting uh, family forest owners to, um, to have management plans and to actually implement them. In terms of demographics, um, only 15% of, and this is for New York, have, have incomes over $100,000 uh, per year. Um, education, 30% have a bachelor's degree or higher, so fairly well educated. Uh, some of these numbers uh, come from our research, uh, several research projects, is the tenure is, is a bit tough in terms of trying to think long term. Uh, when we have a tenure that, that and then we've done several studies and they varied from 13 to 17 years. So th this means that the land is changing ownership every 13 to 17 years. Um, it's very hard to get landowners to think about long term management uh, when they're really not thinking above 20 years. Uh, in one of our studies, 27% of the sample said they were probably going to sell within the next 20 years. Again, that, that becomes a strong impediment for sustainable management and getting landowners to think uh, long term. Um, that 20%, 27% compares to a national average of uh, 5%, and that's the, uh, the National Forest Woodlands Owners Survey that Brett Butler does. And so the, the New York number is a little bit disconcerting, um, something to, to watch out for in the future. Why do people own their properties? Well, uh, and this is a sort of a compilation of several studies, and, and it basically echoes most of the other research that has been done on this subject is we know that the family forest owners are, you know, owning their properties because of the aesthetics, the recreation, uh, you know, the wildlife habitat, providing biodiversity, um, they might use it for some firewood, uh, pass it on to children and grandchildren. But on every list, timber production usually doesn't even make the top 10. Um, in this list, it's the bottom, the last one, and it's never a priority. However, uh, many of them do cut. They will at some point. Um, even though it's not a priority, they, they cut because uh, they may need money to cover taxes. They may need money to send kids to school, catastrophic help. So although it's not high on the priority list when they get surveyed, uh, it does move up uh, quickly when, uh, you know, they need money. Other research that we've done has shown that those that are owners with larger parcels over the 50-acre mark um, are more likely to harvest, which makes sense. And they have a higher awareness of forest management, which also makes sense. One of the, the tough things that are happening on the landscape right now is this issue of parcelization. Uh, we've, uh, and again, this slide depicts uh, some of the articles that we've written on the subject. Um, and if you ever want any of these articles, uh, sent to you as a PDF file, I'll certainly be glad to do that if you want to just email me uh, at some other time. Um, but what we're seeing is, is what I call a sprawling forested landscape. And whether it's in New York or Massachusetts or Wisconsin, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's happening all over the country. Uh, basically what we're seeing is the rural resource management areas slowly transitioning to uh, rural residential areas. And, and obviously, as uh, a forester and someone who's uh, interested in maintaining a working landscape, uh, this is a, a problem. Here's just one of the uh, maps from our study. Uh, this shows uh, two 50-acre parcels uh, that, that were wooded uh, that got subdivided into these five-acre uh, subdivisions. And so this is just uh, an example of things that happen uh, on the rural landscape, and obviously once you've done this, uh, this is never going to be a working landscape again. One of our studies uh, looked at parcelization uh, in a county that had actually lost um, 
people. Uh, Oneida County is, is just uh, east of Syracuse, and uh, it lost an Air Force base and some of its big employers in the manufacturing sector. Uh, and so we wanted, we were curious to see if uh, even in an, an area that was losing people, whether you still had parcelization occurring. And as you can see from the average parcel size, uh, even with the, the number of people going from 253, 253,000 in 1980 to 235, 2000, uh, the parcel size is decreasing. So you have this idea of a sprawling without population growth. And usually you just assume there's going to be sprawling with population growth, but not necessarily when you're losing population. But in this case, it's happening uh, regardless. So people are, you know, they want to live out in the country and they, and so they, they want that space bubble, as we say. I've done a lot of work in the New York City watershed, which is uh, the Catskill region, uh, just northwest of New York City. Uh, this area is a uh, about 1 million acres uh, that supplies New York City with its drinking water supply. And so obviously uh, the managers of the watershed are, are extremely concerned about uh, development in the watershed, and we've done some studies, and, and these are the, the counties of the watershed, and you can see the average uh, parcel size has gone from uh, 19 in 1984 to 16 in 2000, and of course, uh, 13 years later, I'm sure that number is probably down to uh, 12 or 13. What we're really concerned with, um, and I actually had a student, and a graduate student, trying to prove this. This was from a study we did with Seth LaPierre. Um, and it shows that <clears throat> we were having this, this big boost in parcels that are five to 10 acres. Um, basically, uh, people are, are moving out in the countryside and you know getting their little piece of paradise, uh, which is fine. Uh, a colleague of mine, Dave Kittredge from uh, UMass calls it big houses and big backyards. Um, and so I, I think, you know, that's fine that people do that, but unfortunately for forest management, usually when you get to this point, uh, you're not doing forest management anymore, and, and that, that forest will be taken out of productivity. And so this is what we're seeing happening in the watershed and across the Northeast is this sprawling of these big lots, uh, making it very difficult, uh, mainly because of economies of scale, uh, to do forest management. So uh, my current graduate student is spatially trying to, to, to prove this in the New York City watershed. So we know it's happening, uh, but we want to create, using GIS, a map of hotspots where, uh, you know, some of the problem areas are where people are, are really subdividing into these uh, five to 10 acre lots uh, because this won't be good for water quality uh, in the future. Here's just another map from uh, Greene County, New York, and it, it shows uh, a very dramatic example of uh, parcelization. And what you're seeing are those five to 10 acre lots uh, that I was just talking about. And what you see is, is uh, developers are maximizing the number of lots they can put along road frontage. So you see these long, narrow lots, uh, very similar to what you might see uh, for lake frontage, where you see people are getting 50 feet of lake frontage, and then they have, you know, this long, narrow lot that goes back. Uh, so this is what we're seeing in the watershed. Um, and uh, obviously, in 1984, we see large parcels that easily could be managed uh, for sustainable management. And then you look at 2000, and I'm sure today it's even worse. Uh, you'd have to get a, a lot of people to cooperate to manage uh, the parcels now. Uh, the way they've been set up. Um, so this is, again, very troublesome uh, to resource managers. How do our numbers from our Oneida study and our Catskill region study compare to the Northeast in general? And you can see where, you know, what's happening in New York is not unique uh, to the Northeast. The, the numbers are very similar. Um, but when I look at this table, I, I see the glass is, is half full rather than half empty because we still have nearly a third of our area in those woodlots above 50 acres. So, I, and, and as long as we stay into that, 
larger lot, I think we're still in a position of being able to manage our forests for all the amenities they provide, including wildlife habitat, water quality, and timber, and recreation. Um, so I, I think if we can keep it in the 60% range, uh, that would be good. I'd be interested to see what this looks like today uh, in 2013. One of the studies we did was uh, we literally went to these parcelized woodlots and because the, some of the folks that reviewed our earlier papers uh, were questioning whether uh, parcelization actually leads to development. And it seemed intuitive to us that it does. Uh, usually when you parcelize, you eventually build. And uh, but we we needed to prove it empirically, and so this paper does that. We literally would go to these parcels that got subdivided, and we'd walk around with a wheel measuring all the impervious surface area, uh, mainly because we were doing the research in the New York City watershed where impervious surface area leads to runoff, leads to nutrient loading, which will have a negative impact on water quality. Um, and what we found was that with each new parcel, you, you get about 500, 5,000 square feet of impervious surface area. And so this is a, a good number for resource managers in the watershed to, you know, to grab onto. And so for future planning purposes, as they try to control growth in the watershed, they can look at this and say, okay, this is what we have to deal with on average. This is what we're going to get for impervious surface area. Another study we did in central New York looked at um, road and population density and how that impacts sustained yield management. Uh, again, this is related to parcelization and sprawl. And so as, as we do keep sprawling onto the, those lands that are supposed to be dedicated to resource management, uh, are, are we going to lose our ability to manage these lands? And so that's what this research was, was after. And we did it, serve, we, uh, the methods, and I won't go into them deeper here, but basically the methods were that we surveyed um, foresters from the region, state consulting and industry foresters, and had them look at a map of all the towns, and basically they were rating each town as to its ability to uh, provide sustained yield management opportunities in the future. Not just one harvest, uh, but are these towns in a position to, with forest lands that they can manage uh, in the long term? And so generally that's what we did, and then we did logistic regression to come up with our figures. So the first graph tells us that we looked at road density as well as population density. And what you see here is that when you have four miles, linear miles per square mile uh, of roads, you have zero chance of sustained yield management. When you get to the point of one and a half linear miles per square mile, uh, you have 100% chance of in, uh, doing sustained yield management. Uh, no one had ever done anything like this before. Obviously, this is going to vary depending on where you are, but I think it's fairly relevant to the Northeast even going as far west as I noticed we had someone from Wisconsin, I think these numbers would probably hold pretty well there as well. This isn't going to mean a lot to most of you, uh, but these are just two towns close to Syracuse. Uh, the top map shows Fabius, uh, which is just uh, near one of our college properties where we have a, an experimental forest, hybrid forest. So it's a rural area with lots of farms. Uh, and this, this map shows two miles, just so you can see what two miles, linear miles per square mile road density looks like. So Fabius would have a 75% opportunity for sustained yield management. So if you drive in Fabius, you're, you'd say, yeah, I, I think that, that makes sense. And then I took my hometown of Lysander, which is a northern suburb of Syracuse, uh, has four miles per square mile and has therefore zero percent. And if you drive through Lysander, 
although you will see some fields and abandoned farmland for the most part it's uh, basically a you know, suburban uh, area on the verge of maybe some farmland and basically it looks uh, like a place that has zero percent chance of sustainable management so that's a way of ground truthing some of our numbers is so when you drive around does it make sense the other thing we looked at and other people had looked at population density uh, David Weir of the Forest Service had a paper out uh, back in the 90s, mid-90s, I think, um, looking at not so much sustainable yield management, but uh, harvesting opportunities. So we, we took it to the next level. We, we weren't just looking for the one harvest. We wanted to see long-term whether it could maintain sustainable yield management opportunities. But our numbers are, are fairly close to what David Weir came up with. Uh, we had 0% chance of uh, sustainable yield management with 300 people per square mile, uh, and then up to 90% chance when you have 15 people per square mile. And again, I think these numbers work fairly well in the east-northeast areas. Again, our two sample towns, uh, Fabius, which is very rural, has 42 people per square mile and 75% chance of sustained yield management. And as you drive out there, you say, yep, that makes sense. And then, of course, my hometown of Lysander, 323 people per square mile, and 0% uh, chance of sustained yield management. I asked my grad student, uh, Brandon Vickery, to extrapolate from our central New York uh, region that we did the study into in the entire state of New York, and you could do this for the entire United States, but, you know, I, I'd be certainly, it would work in the Northeast perhaps, but what it does is it provides us with somewhat of a planning tool. Uh, anything in yellow is good. That means you have a, you know, you're above 50% chance of sustained yield management. So if you look at the Adirondack region or the Catskill region, uh, and this is population density we're looking at now, uh, you see that those those areas have, uh, you know, a high chance of uh, sustained yield management. You can see all the red uh, starting from Buffalo to Rochester to Syracuse to Albany and, of course, New York City. Um, that that point on Long Island is is mainly because there are a lot of big houses, but not that many people out there. Um, and so I don't think anyone's going to be doing sustained yield management on Long Island uh, anytime soon. Uh, so that, that one doesn't really make much sense. But just take a look at the yellow, and then I'm going to switch over now to road density. And you see that the, suddenly the, the picture is, isn't as clear. You get a lot more subtlety, a lot more orange. Uh, the expanses of yellow have been cut up a little bit. So what we're trying to do here with the road density and population density is as if people become concerned about losing forest land and timberland, this may be a good planning tool. Um, using both population density and road density uh, and making maps like this and trying to figure out, okay, where are we starting to lose ground here? Uh, when you have both road density and population density suggesting that it's going to be difficult for sustainable management, then you know you, you have to start maybe looking at those adjacent areas and maybe curving whatever's happening, uh, perhaps with zoning or, or whatever. The last thing we did on this study was try to answer the question that everyone's always asking me: is well, at what acreage threshold? Are, are you able to do sustained yield management? Of course, there isn't any magical number, uh, but when Brandon crunched the numbers, uh, he came up with 30 acres, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, and then 15 acres is a 50% chance of sustained yield management. Uh, so uh, I think both of those numbers make sense. Uh, we'd, we'd like to, at least in New York State, where the, uh, the threshold for um, being accepted into the New York Forest tax laws, 50 acres. Uh, we were hoping to use this as leverage to get them to lower that to 30 acres, particularly with, you know, as parcel size go down, 
a lot of landowners can't participate in tax program because they don't have 50 contiguous acres. Uh, but we haven't had success yet. Okay, so these are some of the, the what I've just covered are some of the, the negative forces uh, on family forests. Um, let's now shift gears and talk about um, forestry, silviculture, and best management practices, and forest cover. So I, I've come up with a term uh, that I encourage you all to use as much as possible. Um, <laughs> It's uh, the forest cover complacency syndrome. Uh, some folks might just say it's the green line. And what I'm talking about here is that we've actually increased forest cover in New York uh, over the last uh, several decades. Not by much, but it's been very stable. Some regions of the, like the Catskill region has actually gone up. Uh, as some of the farms are abandoned, uh, you know, they pioneer back into forests. And so, it gives us a false sense of security when we see these forest cover numbers being stable or actually increasing. Uh, but what we're actually seeing and what I've just described to you uh, was this idea of uh, resource management areas being slowly transitioning into rural residential while the forest cover stays high. And so the point here is don't use forest cover as your barometer uh, for uh, forest health or the, the health of our timberlands, uh, because uh, uh, you have to understand that the way they measure forest cover is from a satellite imagery, and all it takes is 10% forest on one acre to qualify as forest cover. And so it's really what's happening underneath that forest cover that's, that's the issue, and that's a lot of parcelization, a lot of impervious surface area. And, and declining economies of scale for civil culture and forest operations. So what kind of stocking are we seeing on family woodlots? So the, the next uh, tables that I'm gonna show are, are basically snapshots. Um, they're from different studies. Some of them were, were woodshed studies looking at, you know, uh, when we had some pushes for biomass facilities in the state, people wanted us to do, um, you know, volume studies as to how much, you know, volume of, of biomass there was. And so we were just sort of taking a snapshot of what was available. And so this first table shows us right here in Onondaga County, we looked at 49 woodlots, parcels, um, all family forests, and they were all primarily even-aged hardwoods. In fact, uh, for this presentation, I, I took out uh, anything that wasn't. And what we're seeing, this is just a snapshot, is 100 square feet of basal area on average, a relative density of around 80, and a volume of around 2,000 board feet per acre. Okay, so this, that, that's an Onondaga camp. Oneida, again, this is where we did the parcelization study. Again, uh, about 50 woodlots were visited. Our basal areas are 113 per square feet, uh, square feet per acre. Relative density is 77%. Our volume is less than 2,000 board feet per acre. And our percent basal area of, of acceptable growing stock is uh, 57%. And I'll talk about these in a minute. Well, I just wanted to give you these snapshots. And here's our Catskills, our woodshed. And you see the same trend, about 100 square feet of basal area, 77% relative density, 3,000 board feet per acre, and percent basal area in acceptable growing stock is 54%. So is this good, bad? Uh, when I give this presentation to foresters or I, I show the numbers, to maybe a consulting forester or a procurement forester, how would they react? If you're on a woodlot that has 2,000 board feet per acre, is there an operable cut there? Is there an opportunity to do legitimate tending, thinning? Or are these woodlots in need of rehabilitation? Uh, and the answer is true, true, true. It, some of them may have an operable cut, uh, but we're right on the borderline because um, this is pretty low stocking in terms of volume. 
when you look at the stocking chart, and, and so what you're looking at now is a northern hardwood stocking chart. Um, and the idea here is at 100% relative density, um, you're on the A line. And that means that your, your stand is fully stocked. In fact, it, it needs to be thin. At the B line, and anywhere between the A and the B line is, is the sweet zone. And that's 60% uh, relative density and 80%. So it's almost like uh, we're, we're looking pretty good because most of these, uh, the three previous tables I showed you said that we had about 80% relative density. We were about 100 square feet of basal area. So I put the star right there. That's basically where we're averaging. But we have low volume per acre and we have lots of unacceptable growing stock. So this is the problem, is a lot of these woodlots have been high graded. Uh, a lot of them have, have gone through dimerylinic cutting. And so although they may look okay when you place them on a stocking chart, uh, when you walk through them, you're looking at a, a degraded stand with too much unacceptable growing stock. And many of these woodlots need to be rehabilitated some of them can be thinned once more. Uh, some of them need to be regenerated. So th that's just a snapshot of what uh, that we found over uh, the last decade, looking at some of our, um, our research. Now I want to transition into the actual management. So how are these woodlots being managed? And now we're, we're taking a, a little more in-depth approach to this. Uh, this question. So the next series of slides is based on us looking at the level of civil culture that was implemented as well as the level of best management practices that were implemented on 123 harvest sites. Um, basically what we did is we sent out uh, invitations to landowners to allow us to go on their properties if they had harvested during the last five years from when the study started. So what we were trying to do was figure out what they had cut. We actually measured the stumps, and I'll go through that in the, um, in the methods. The first thing we did is look at their BNPs, best management practices. Uh, literally, we had a wheel with us uh, looking at, uh, you know, the intervals in which water bars were put in, things like that. That's a picture of one of my graduate students. But we looked at landings, forest roads, skid trails, forest road stream crossings, skid trail stream crossings, and water diversion devices, such as water bars. And here's a series of slides to just show you what our scoring, how, how we did our scoring. Uh, so basically what you're looking at now is a washed out skid trail that has no water bars on it. You can see uh, it's highly eroded. And our scoring system was zero to three. And so this would have gotten a score of zero. This shows a water bar was attempted, but you can also see that the water uh, going down the skid trail breached it. And so this would get, and then the other problem with this water bar is it's it's not angled at a 30 degree angle, it's, it's more perpendicular. And so they get a one for effort, um, but uh, it's not a properly working water bar. Here's one that is angled correctly. You can tell it's working, but it was also breached. You could see flow going around it. And so this one got a score of two. And of course, we'd also look at the interval. So you, you can see as we go down the slope where the person is standing, it's very steep. And so we would measure if there were enough water bars uh, given the slope of the skid trail. And here's a picture. I remember taking this one of a series of water bars. Uh, all working really well. They, they were very deep and the water was clearly um, getting pushed off into the filter script. So this would have gotten a score of three. Our methods in terms of silviculture was we, we put in fixed plots 
uh, and measured species, diameter, whether they were acceptable or unacceptable growing stock, number of logs, number of bolts in every stem. In order to recreate what was there prior, we were measuring all the stumps, the most recent stumps from that harvest that occurred uh, in the five years prior. And so usually we could tell what uh, species it was uh, because it was a fresh stump. And then we use uh, formulas to recreate what was there in terms of uh, densities. And I know this chart has a lot to it, um, but I will go through it. These were the criteria that we used uh, to measure the level of civiculture occurring. So we were able to assess by measuring those stumps, figure out what was the pre-harvest relative density. And if it was below 80%, then they got a zero score. Uh, if it was above 80%, which is usually that threshold where you could harvest, uh, they'd get a score of one. Uh, and, the, and the silviculture was scored on a zero to one basis. Post harvest relative density. So this is what's left after. If it was below 60% and they took out more than 35% in that harvest, they got a score of zero. If it was either or or, one of the 60% uh, was less than 60% was left or more than 35%. So it was or one of the other, they got a 0.5. And if it was greater than 60% and they, they cut less than 35% relative density, they got a score of one because they were working within the rules of good silviculture for hardwoods. Uh, when you do thinning and tending of a stand, usually you want the quadratic stand diameter to actually go up. Uh, so if we saw that it went down, uh, we gave it a score of zero. If it only went down a little bit, uh, they got a score of 0.5. And if it only went down by a quarter of an inch, uh, so we were pretty lenient on this one, uh, but usually we saw them going down. Uh, they got a score of one if it only went down a quarter of an inch. Then we also looked at the percent of saw timber removals. This was an indicator of high grading. If we saw that greater than 35% of the base layer in saw timber was removed, they got a zero. If it was less than 35%, they got a one. Pole removals, are you tending the poles? Are you trying to get rid of the unacceptable growing stock? Um, if they were basically ignoring the poles, uh, they got a score of zero. If they were, you know, if we could see that there was some tending going on in the poles and it wasn't just the saw timber, uh, they got a score of one. And then the same issue with the high grading is with the percent of high value species being removed. Um, did it change from the original? So the percent of high value species, uh, did it go down after the harvest or did it remain stable? If it went down, they got a zero. If it remained stable, they got a one. And finally, the residual left on the ground, uh, standing, uh, acceptable growing stock, is it greater, less than 35%, they'd get a zero. If it was between 35 to 45, they'd get a 0.5, it was greater than one, greater than 45%, they got a one. So th this is a pretty uh, rigid and uh, vigorous uh, scaling that we did uh, in terms of uh, measuring these woodlots. Here are some of the articles that have been uh, published, uh, just so you know that, you know, I can send you some stuff if you're interested, but today is mostly an overview presentation. So the highlights, we had an average residual base area of around 100 square feet, so very similar to those snapshot photos I showed at the beginning. Relative density was 80%. Acceptable growing stock was on the bubble, meaning that it was right there around 40 to 50% of acceptable growing stock. And our average volume per acre was less than 3,000 uh, feet. Uh, in general, silviculture practice, but not enough. Uh, we saw too much high grading. We did not see hardly any regeneration cuts, uh, which are sorely needed. Uh, one of the big challenges we have with family forest owners is to try to get them to, to think about regenerating their stands. 
Um, and we did see the best of a culture on properties that were enrolled in the forest tax law. Um, those were properties with plans uh, with foresters, and it was nice to see that, you know, that was actually uh, benefiting uh, the silviculture. Here are the results uh, of the scores. And so basically we have 20%, roughly, almost 20%, uh, are doing good silviculture. And you see the management plans and no management plans, and there's a significant difference in that high end, uh, 19%. We have 53% are right in the middle. Uh, we call this um, silviculture purgatory. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, you know, some of those are leaning towards silviculture, some of them are not. And then 28% uh, was very poor. And what you see at the bottom of the screen here is uh, Nylon unpublished. He did a similar study in, in New York and his breakdown, and we use the same scoring system as, as, as he did, was 38% poor, 49% moderate, and 13% high. So, you know, our numbers are very close to what Ralph Nyland got back in the mid-90s. So, again, as we look at the, the, the same stocking chart, we see uh, that 30 to 40% of our landowners are below the sea line, okay, the ones that are not practicing silviculture. These are woodlots that are in basic need of, of rehabilitation. And in fact, Ralph Nyland is, uh, is basically dedicating the, the latter part of his career to this issue of rehabilitation of, of northern hardwood because there are so many high graded and, and dimer limit uh, woodlots that have been through dimer limit cutting several times. And it's, you know, we have this issue of rehabilitation now. So, so we got 30 to 40 percent are, are below the sea line, and you know, big decisions need to be made. Now I'm going to introduce you to the, uh, the silviculture surface. Uh, this first appeared a the early version of this appeared in uh, Ralph Nyland's uh, textbook uh, in 2002, uh, and he. He came up with this surface in consultation with myself and Russ Briggs and Chris Nowak, all uh, um, faculty here in the forestry department. Um, and this is the latest version of the surface. And it, it's a good way to, uh, to talk about uh, and to motivate people uh, to move from degradation where you potentially could be doing long-term uh, impairment to the site uh, moving up to exploitation, where is what, you know, dimer limit cutting and high grading is, where, you know, you're not using any silvicultural concepts, but at least you're not harming the site on a long-term basis. And then finally, you, what we want to do is get people on the surface, as we say, and that would be the silviculture surface, where there is a commitment to resources and application of, of proven concepts of silviculture. Uh, and also there's some actual capital that's invested. So you have the skills and knowledge and the capital invested in doing the right thing silviculturally, and that gets you on the surface. So the question is, is uh, where are we on the surface collectively when we think of uh, family forest owners, at least the ones that we've looked at? Well, I've already talked about that 30, 40%, the ones that had relative densities uh, below 60. Um, some of those may be in in this area of the surface on degradation, uh, you know, or they're in between degradation and exploitation, um, and this isn't a good place to be. So we would like to at least get people up to exploitation. Uh, that's not a very high bar to climb, but uh, but let's hope that we're here and not doing long-term uh, damage to our sites. And I think for the most part, when you are in northern hardwoods or in the temperate forest for that matter, uh, we have very resilient forests here, and uh, it's really hard to degrade them too much. Um, I think uh, our folks from Montana and, and uh, South Dakota, I noticed, where you have more arid conditions, uh, the potential to do long-term damage to the site through forest operations is probably uh, 
you know, a bigger potential than we have here in the Northeast with, with our temperate forests. Now, silviculture purgatory, this is where we're not sure this 53% go. Um, and that was this uh, little photo there is my attempt at uh, finding a, a, a shot of purgatory on the internet. Um, but uh, Ralph Nyland got a kick out of that when he saw it. Um, so we're, we're not sure where these people are going. Are they going in the direction of exploitation or are they moving towards the surface? And hopefully they're making that jump uh, onto the surface and uh, then eventually we hope that they make it um, well, all the way to the top. Uh, and this is what we call the Ralph Nylon Gold Star. And Ralph also gets a kick out of that. Um, but the bottom line is, and, and we've had lots of discussions about this, is that we know that most uh, forest management is occurring very low on the surface, the silviculture surface. Uh, we're in between that exploitation and just barely getting on the surface. Most people are not putting a lot of capital, and uh, unfortunately, uh, even skills and knowledge level isn't good, particularly when the foresters are not involved in planning a harvest. BNP results, um, they were very disappointing. Uh, particularly given that the, the watershed forestry program has put so much money in outreach and extension, uh, trying to train uh, loggers, landowners, foresters. But as you can see, we, we sort of did a, uh, we, we did the study in 2002 and then we replicated it again in 2009 and 11. Um, and in landings, no significant difference. Uh, skid trails, we did see an improvement. Uh, Skid trail stream crossings, we actually uh, got worse, but it's not significant. Forest roads, no difference. Forest road stream crossings, uh, got worse, but not significantly. And then this one here, this is the most common BNP you'll see on a family forest. Quite honestly, all the road ones, uh, there isn't a lot of road building that goes on on family forests here uh, in the Northeast. Uh, it's more on industrial lands that you'll see that or on, on Timo or reed lands. Um, most of the parcelized woodlots are small and so you can actually put a landing right on the, the road and that usually you don't have a lot of road building occurring. So our N, our sample size for the road BNPs was fairly small. But water diversion devices, Things like uh, water bars, I mean, we're, we were extremely poor in 2002 and we just barely got better in, in 2009 and this is where we, we, you know, really expect to see some big improvements. So slight or no improvements in, in terms of BNPs, uh, poor implementation of stream crossings and water diversion devices. Uh, this is a, a big uh, red flag uh, for water quality, and so uh, the Watershed Forestry Program was extremely happy to get these results. They weren't happy with the results, but they were happy to get them to know that they need to do more work. Um, and the other thing that was disappointing was that we did not have any difference in BNP implementation between properties with management plans and those without management plans. Again, uh, that was a big disappointment. I threw this in. Uh, it wasn't part of the original uh, uh, presentation that I gave last spring, uh, but we, we've done a, a study in Vermont. And so I decided to compare the results from Vermont with the uh, New York study. And what we found is uh, the silviculture in Vermont was being done slightly better than uh, New York. Uh, in terms of BNPs, uh, on just about every count, uh, the, the BNPs were, were uh, better in Vermont than in New York. Um, what's interesting and it, what we saw in Vermont was a lot more silviculture, uh, deliberate silviculture, uh, where you know the landowners were telling us and the foresters exactly what they were doing in terms of, of prescriptions for the lots that we looked at. And we looked at 59 
in Vermont. We crown thinnings, shelter woods, and that was a, a nice uh, you know thing to see is, is actual regeneration cuts. We had silvicultural clear cuts, and um, and so we saw some silviculture. And then you see here saw timber potential is uh, even if there wasn't clear cut silviculture, uh, the woodlots were left with some potential to produce saw timber. So they, they were exploited, but they were still in good shape. Uh, and, you know, there was positive future for those. Um, only 11% showed no potential for the future. Um, and so, again, that, that was positive. Uh, a big thing that we found in Vermont uh, that the uh, Vermont Parks and Recreation jumped on immediately was how well the woodlots under their current use plan performed, uh, which is their version of a forest tax law, versus those properties with no plan. Uh, across the board, uh, and the asterisk means it's uh, significantly different. Uh, the silviculture was performed at a higher level, and the BMPs were all performed at a higher level uh, than those with no plan. Um, because the, we did the study during a, a time when the, the Vermont legislature was considering defunding or reducing the funds to the current use plan, uh, they were very quick to grab our results and show uh, the positive impact of um, the current use plan because county foresters are involved in helping landowners uh, with management plans. Consulting foresters are intimately involved with the management plans themselves. And so, and it clearly is working uh, for these woodlots in Vermont. So hopefully they used it and leveraged some good uh, benefits for them in terms of uh, whatever happened to the current use plan. I, I think that it's fully funded. Um, and so maybe this helped a little bit. So we're getting close to concluding here. I just wanted to, to revisit our questions. Um, are family forest productive? Uh, well, annual allowable cut has been greatly diminished by high grading. Um, the ability to implement sustained yield management has been severely compromised. And I think we're in this period where many of these woodlots uh, that are only averaging anywhere from two to 3,000 board feet per acre uh, are in need of rehabilitation, particularly when half of the, the stocking is unacceptable growing stock. So, it, you know, the woodlots are not going to be able to provide revenues for several decades. Um, in terms of sustainability, uh, we are not seeing enough regeneration cuts. Uh, in fact, we're not seeing much regeneration, period. Um, and so that's a, a serious problem. And when we are seeing regeneration, it's not the desired species. And so again, we, we need to get foresters and, and owners to work together and make some big decisions about regenerating. Um, and I see here that the, fortunately we're still fully funded in Vermont. That's great. Uh, so consequently, our forests are not in a good position to combat uh, invasive species effects of climate change, which are, are both extremely real and, you know, right in our face right now. Um, we got these critters. I'm not going to go into much detail here, but you've heard of Asian longhorn beetle, which has been in New York, Massachusetts, and it's devastating to hardwoods. Uh, we all know about the emerald ash borer and its impact on white ash. And we know about the hemlock willia delgid that's uh, you know, killing the hemlock, and that's critical to these riparian areas where hemlock is usually concentrated. Um, and then the big thing that we're seeing in New York, and I'm sure some of you are seeing it in your own woodlots, is we're opening the door when we do poor management to these uh, invasive uh, shrubs and plants. And, and just a, a few examples, multiflora rose, Tartarian honeysuckle, Japanese barberry, they have the ability to absolutely suffocate an understory. Uh, not only do they become havens for ticks, which are spreading uh, throughout the southern tier of New York, uh, but you cannot regenerate. Uh, and then you have to really uh, do some heroic things to get rid of them. Um, and so when you have poor management, it opens the door for some of these invasives to 
to just uh, make life extremely difficult for managers and owners. And then, of course, we have climate change, and, uh, and that's going to change how hardy some species are. Um, and so the list here is, you know, we can expect with climate change, and this has been, uh, you know, proven that it's drought will exacerbate pests and pathogen problems. Um, and what we're saying here is that silviculture isn't going to solve any of these problems. But if you're implementing silviculture, you're being proactive uh, rather than reactive. And so if we can be more proactive in terms of regenerating our forests, properly tending our forests, then regenerating them when they need to be, uh, and being proactive in trying to get the right species, whether it's sugar maple, red oak, or whatever you're managing for. Um, and then the other thing we need to be re uh, proactive about is that some of these species that we may lose because of pests or because of, uh, you know, problems with uh, climate change. And so, again, silviculture can help you be ahead of the curve rather than reacting to it. Uh, and so and I, right now we're just not seeing that happening uh, out there. Um, hopefully the audience today are the exception and, and you guys don't have the problems that we've been seeing on some of these woodlots. So I think I just want to emphasize temperate forests are inherently resilient. I mean, the reason we have such great forest cover here is because we always get trees back. I'm looking out my window in Syracuse and as soon as a building is abandoned in Syracuse, the trees start to come up, box elder, uh, you name it. And, uh, and so it's not about maintaining forest cover. It's mainly about what kind of forest do we want for the future. And if people are actually managing their forests for revenues, then you really have to be careful about doing the right thing uh, because this, you know, series of high grading over and over again has just left a lot of these forests is totally degraded and, and not in a good position. Uh, to provide revenues to even cover taxes in the future. So I think that's the big issue is uh, is about the future. And on that note, uh, the 359 on my computer, um, we can open it up for questions. I can give the ball back to Peter if he wants to take it, or um, I'll be looking at my screen here. Great job, Renee. That was uh, really well done. Um, it doesn't matter that at this point the, the presenter ball can go in, in either location. So this was, um, I think, right on the mark, and it, and it really did a good job of, of describing the situation in New York and some of the in Vermont and, and some of the patterns that presumably would occur throughout the Northeast. So one kind of question that would require maybe some speculation, you worked in Vermont, you worked in New York with these studies. To what extent do you think those patterns would exist if, you know, as you went into uh, Massachusetts and Connecticut, and Maine, and New Hampshire, and Pennsylvania, and Ohio? Is this is, is it unique to New York, or is it? You know, what are the what would be the factors that would that would uh, contribute to the similarity or dissimilarity of those patterns into different states? Yeah, when I talk to colleagues in New England. Uh, they have it even worse than we do in New York. Um, you know, the folks in Massachusetts have uh, the most urbanized state in the country, I think they say. Um, and so I, I think that it's the trends that we're seeing uh, in terms of parcelization and, and you know, poor to mediocre management is uh, – is is in all the surrounding states. Uh, you know, I talked to the extension forester down in the, in Pennsylvania, Jim Finley. He's he's they're seeing the same things down there uh, that that we have here. You know, it's funny. I should I was telling you I was looking out my window at the little strips of forest right here on campus, <laughs> and just as I'm talking, two deer are are walking. So we have deer right here on campus, uh, and I didn't even mention the deer problem. Uh, that was a bit beyond, but, you know, they, they're everywhere, uh, even right here in our parking lot, eating whatever they can. <laughs> huh. So um, are there, so this is the, 
point when if there are questions, feel free to uh, write those in. There's also, I posted the link to the exit survey, so if everyone would please click on that exit survey link, that would be handy. Um, there's a, a consulting forester that was on earlier that had to leave, and he sent me a, a, a comment um, just before he left. He sent it privately. He said his experience in New York uh, versus Pennsylvania shows that tax levels, so the taxation, rate of taxation, and insensitive programs have an impact on, a, on the willingness of an owner and the owner's ability to invest or forego income. Um, and to make long-term management um, decisions. Is that, so how do how do taxes, do you have a sense of how taxes or other things play into owner decisions and where you showed the silvicultural surface and the need to make investments of capital, people need to have money to make that investment. So where to, yeah, where to, it, you know. it's, yeah, unfortunately that's not, you know, in many regions of our state, and in many regions of New York, uh, the taxes, the property taxes are, are too high to even justify managing, uh, you know, that, you know, not, I'm not, I shouldn't say justify managing, but uh, in the old days, let's say 30 years ago, you could cover your property taxes with forest management. In many parts of the state now, including the New York City watershed and the Catskill region, the taxes are too high uh, to cover your property taxes and, and through forest management. Uh, and so this is a big issue. And that's why we really wanted to get the minimum acreage for participating in the forest tax law down to 30 acres so that more people could get involved and get that tax benefit. Okay, so if you had um, if you had a, a group of foresters and a group of landowners together, and you wanted to give them a particular message, you know what I mean. What message might you give? You know, with with the outcome being you know trying to improve the sustainability and the productivity and the resilience of family forests, what would be the message for foresters, and what would be the message for uh, landowners? I think the message would be that both of them have to um, stop going into woodlots and just thinning. All, that's all everyone's doing now is, is no one is making the big decision to really step back and say, okay, we're, we really need to regenerate because we're, we're looking at a resource that is anywhere from 80 to 100 years old uh, for the most part, uh, even aged. And and there's been this tending of the forest with lots of saw timber coming out. And uh, at this point, we, we've hit a wall and uh, it's time to make a decision as to whether uh, you're gonna regenerate the forest because you can't keep tending, uh, weeding the garden forever. And I think that's the, the message that I think a lot of us are trying to get out is that the consultants and the you know and the procurement foresters have just been going in and doing a thinning, doing a thinning, doing another thinning. We'll come back every 10, 15 years and do another thinning. Well, they've been doing that for 50 years, and it's time to, like I said, our our numbers show that we're at two to three thousand board feet per acre, and you, you can't just keep thinning because you there's nothing left, particularly when you have so many unacceptable growing stocks. So, uh, I say regenerate. And again, that's a tough pill to swallow because it, it does mean that you're going to have to make some big decisions and your forest might look different. The other, the other thing that Ralph Nyland talks about is this conversion to uneven age management, uh, which has also been uh, talked about. But that requires a lot of time and uh, a lot of expertise. Um, and so, but some people may be more comfortable with that because uh, you still have lots of forests and you don't have to make a big decision about doing like a seed tree or sh shelter wood uh, that you would in an even age system. So, um, so either convert to an even age or regenerate would be my message. Okay. Are there, um, I've been asking all the questions, are, are if folks have questions, please feel free to, to type them in. Um, you mentioned thinning. The uh, the the numbers that you showed looks like 
um, you know, it might technically be thinning, but the, the allocation of the cut was shifting the 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 way the cut was being selected was shifting the, the balance of away from acceptable growing stock to unacceptable growing stock, and so it you know at some point, and you obviously know this, the you know the weeding becomes. You know, there are not so many weeds that you can take out anymore, but you're just starting to take some of the so some of the crop is starting to disappear as well, yep. and then pretty soon you have less to work with. So and that's the wall I'm talking about that we've hit. Um, the, the thing that I was just giving this talk to my class uh, last week about, you know, I, I've been amazed in over the past 20 years at the the increase in biomass markets that we have. And mm -hmm. I've been waiting forever for biomass to become a, a viable market for our unacceptable growing stock and our because we don't have many parts of this state, we don't have good pulp markets. And so um you know, I think that that hopefully in the future uh we will have viable markets, biomass markets, and uh and that may help people uh be able to do these kinds of you know make these decisions on getting rid of the unacceptable growing stock and and actually regenerating. I, I think I see a question here. Can you repost the site for quit? Oh, okay. Yep, I did that. And then Trevor's asking, so some folks maybe came in late. If you'd like a copy of this presentation as a PDF, if you go to the upper left-hand corner to the file menu and then select save or save as uh, the document, and then you'll be able to save that as a PDF. It'll, it'll default to saving it as a UD, I'm sorry, UCF format. You need to select a PDF format so that you can more easily read it. So, all right, well, I don't, I don't see any questions. Um, are there, uh, I guess we'll we'll wind this down then, Renee. Thank you again for doing this. This was a fabulous presentation. It was exactly the the message that I think is important to get out there. Um, I've recorded it and I will uh, post. Uh, oh, well, yeah, we won't we won't shut down. <laughs> Trevor, we'll we'll hang on for a minute here so everybody can download if they want. But we'll um uh I'll be this has been recorded and I'll um, upload the recording to the YouTube channel, the Forest Connect YouTube channel, so people can see it, and then I'll send out a, an announcement to, uh, to the full database of registered webinar participants so that they can have access to that. So, and you're giving a presentation like this, or maybe this one, or a similar one? I'm actually, uh, I gave a few of those slides on Vermont. Uh -huh. And so in December, I'm gonna be giving you know, a webinar just on that Vermont study. Okay. Yep. And that's on right. December, I can't remember, December 4th or something. Okay. I saw that announcement come out from wherever, from the Northern States Research yes, yes. Cooperative. Yep. So, okay, very good. Well, Renee, thank you again, and thanks to all our participants, and we will see you all next month, December whatever, December 18th, I guess, is the third Wednesday. So I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving and a, and a good start to winter. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you for the opportunity, Peter. Yes, thank you, Renee. I appreciate it.